We are at chapter 15 of the Tripura Rasya. The chapter is called The Awareness of Consciousness and the Lesson Given to Ashtavakra. Ashtavakra is a figure who features also in other texts and this chapter is devoted to the story of Ashtavakra and it's a very interesting story also the conversation between Ashtavakra and King Janak. King Janak also is a character that appears in other scriptures. Parshurama was astonished by this thought-provoking story about the Rocky Mountain. With a purified mind, he went to Dattatreya and prostrated in front of him. O oh Lord, you imparted magnificent teachings through a story, and I began contemplating upon them. I understand that pure knowledge alone is truth, and that the objects of the world are as unreal as the images reflected in a mirror. Just to briefly recap, he is referring to the story between Mahasena and the son of the great sage, the yogi, who had created an entire universe within a mountain. This story explained that everything really is like a dream. They are compared to the objects seen in a mirror. Now in those days, they did not have cinema. But today we have movies, we have television, and we see many stories unfold on these screens. And so modern terminology would be cinema or the screen that projects all these movies or you know stories is Life is like that. It's like a movie or it's like something on your television screen. It is an illusion. It's not real. You know that. And when you go in a movie and you sit and watch and you may get emotionally involved or you may be uh, happy or sad, but you know it's a movie and it's not real. And so this life is also unreal. Verse 5. Parshurama continues. He says to Dattatreya, O great mother Maheshwari, tell me if consciousness itself manifests this phenomenal world from its unmanifested state of deep sleep to the dreaming and waking states. Pure consciousness is direct knowledge. This manifestation of the universe is without any cause, but springs spontaneously from the self-existent reality. This I understand, having listened with a purified mind. Consciousness cannot be comprehended through intellectual knowledge because it is pure and unblemished by the mind and its modifications. I am bewildered and want to know how realization is attained, without which the goal is not attained. What is the nature of liberation? If liberation is attained in this lifetime, does the lifestyle of the liberated one change for the good? How does one behave if he is liberated? The enlightened ones sometimes seem to be engaged in external activities. In such cases, how do they relate to the external world, to pure consciousness? If they have attained the highest consciousness, how can they function in the external world? In this diversity, how can I find unity and see that liberation is possible in the midst of external activities? Why do we notice diff apparent differences in the enlightened sages? A few seem to be active. A few are teaching the scriptures. 
A few worship the deities in different manners. A fortunate few remain in samadhi. Others observe austerities while mortifying their bodies and senses. A few teach their students clearly and sincerely. Some of the enlightened ones rule the country with full justice. Some of them remain engaged in thrashing out philosophical differences. A few of them are busy writing scriptures. Some of them pretend to be abnormal in their behavior. But these individuals of different categories gain fame like the wise do. How can there be a difference in their behavior if they really are liberated? Are there different states and grades of liberation? Kindly resolve these conflicts because I have immense respect for you and a burning desire to know the truth. So that's a very interesting question. Parshurama has asked something that a lot of students are confused about and that is about enlightenment itself. And it seems from scriptures, from stories and from perhaps his having met different sages these questions have come up. What happens after liberation? Does the person change? Does the person seem to be different from for the one who is relating to him, who is, who is talking to him, who has some day-to-day -day, uh, relationship with him? What happens to a liberated person? Does he really change? so much that he is unable to do anything in the external world? Or are they able to continue their activities? A lot of seekers are under the impression that if you attain enlightenment, it's basically death and that you cannot do anything in the external world anymore. A lot of people are basically under the impression that it's, it's like death. So how is it with enlightenment? Why is it that some sages seem so different? Are they all the same? Do they all become like little copies of each other? And if they are different, why is it that they are different? That means they have personalities. And why is it that some are teaching others while some prefer to remain in samadhi? Why is it that some are practicing austerities and some still worship idols? And some are busy writing scriptures? <laughs> and some even pretend to be abnormal. Why would they pretend to be abnormal? They pretend to be abnormal because they do not wish to be disturbed. So they act like they're mad or crazy and chase away students or those who are simply curious. So in brackets it says here, it's difficult for a layman to discriminate. Perfect meets perfect. For meeting perfect, one must be perfect. This means that in order to understand a wise person, you need to be wise yourself. It is said in this scripture somewhere later that only a thief recognizes a thief. Most of us don't know how to recognize criminals and crooked people, people with poor, bad intentions, evil intentions, because we don't think like that. But one who is himself a thief knows what other thieves, how they behave, how they think, how they look. And so it's very difficult for a student to really recognize a sage, an enlightened person or a teacher. Any thoughts about this? Dattatreya was pleased 
and answered all the questions of his favorite disciple in the following manner. Parshurama, you are the best among the wise. You must have had a glimpse of reality. You are endowed with good thoughts and thus you deserve to know the truth. When the mind starts treading, treading the path of truth, then one deserves the profound grace of Divine Mother. Without her loving grace, who can attain final liberation? The purpose is accomplished when the sadhaka's mind becomes joyous and he constantly contemplates and thus strengthens his creativity. So far, you have rightly understood the nature of consciousness. Knowledge without profound experience is not considered to be true knowledge. Therefore, do not have any doubt. The profound experience of self is constant awareness of I am. And for such a knower, the illusions of the world disappear. Indirect knowledge is like a dream. As access to the treasure house of wealth in a dream is a fantasy, so indirect knowledge is like a dream. So that Tatreya explains in these short verses that one who starts treading on the path of truth deserves grace. We use the word uses the word deserve here because one who has good intentions must be in some way <clears throat> rewarded, encouraged, and that is the law of karma. So if you put the effort, you want to, to understand the truth, then you will find good things coming to you and you will find yourself developing. But for the final liberation, the grace is required. And grace comes when you do your effort. So, Sadhaka must strengthen his willpower, his Sankalp Shakti, and keep on practicing praying and contemplating. It even uses the word constantly contemplates. So when you have that kind of intensity, then you are bound to develop. It's the law of karma. Dattatreya now tells a beautiful story. So let me explain through a beautiful story. Once upon a time in the kingdom of Videha, there was a wise king named Janaka. King Janaka is always quoted as a singular example, a knower of the universe and beyond. Once he performed a ceremony for attaining final liberation. Many Brahmins and learned ascetics Hermits and intellectuals, well versed in the Vedas, participated in the ceremony. During the same time, Varuna, the presiding deity of water, wished to perform a similar ceremony. But the prominent sages and scholars did not participate in that ceremony. All the great ones from different walks of life were pleased to receive Janaka's hospitality. In revenge, Varuna's son persecuted many learned Brahmins. He even disguised himself as a Brahmin and entered the royal house to bless the king and address the assembly, saying, O king, this assembly is not suitable for this occasion. It is like a beautiful lake full of lotuses, being used by crows, jackals, jackdaws, and herons. These Incompetent people are useless. I don't find anyone who is wise like a swan and can discriminate between truth and ignorance as the swan separates 
milk from water. I do not want to participate in an assembly of idiots. Listening to these insulting words, the entire assembly of learned people became angry. You charlatan, what right have you to insult this assembly of wise people? What ability do you have that makes you believe you can defeat us in debate? Idiot, why are you speaking thus? You will have to debate with us before you leave this assembly. Most of the educated people of the world are gathered here, you fool. Do you think you have the ability to debate with all of us? Tell us what exquisite knowledge you have that will defeat us all in debate. To this challenge, the son of Varuna responded, I can conquer you all in a moment, but on one condition. If you defeat me, throw me in the ocean. If I win, I will drown whomever I defeat. First accept this wager and then we will start debating. So the son of Varuna is, is creating disturbance in the assembly and he's challenging people to a debate. And Varuna is the deity of the ocean, the lord of the sea. And so he's very clever. He says that if I'm defeated, you throw me in the ocean. And of course, that's the element of his father. And so, of course, throwing him in the ocean is not going to harm him in any way. And he says, if you lose, I will throw you in the ocean. And we know very well that the reason for that is that he wants to have Brahmins for his father's ceremony. So they would all end up going to the ceremony of the Lord of the Ocean. So this was his very clever plan. All the Brahmins accepted the challenge and they debated with Varuna's son. With his fallacious logic, he defeated all of the learned people and threw them in the ocean. Varuna's soldier picked up the drowning people and took them to his ceremonial dais, where they, they were received with great reverence. Those Brahmins who were drowning and then rescued were pleased by Varuna's hospitality. Another point here to notice is that he defeated them with fallacious logic. What this means is we know that from earlier story also in the scripture that the Tripura Rahasya is not in favor of intellectual learning, intellectual knowledge or this kind of logic which, with which one can sound very clever, but it shows a lack of direct experience. So learning scriptures, study them, one can start arguing about something you don't know anything about. And this scripture is very, very clearly against such kind of discussions. So Dattatraya continues to tell the story. Ashtavakra, the son of Kahola, well versed in the art of irrational reasoning, heard of his father being thrown in the ocean. He hurried to the court and vanquished the son of Varuna and then ordered him to drown himself. The son of Varuna revealed his identity and restored the lost Brahmins from his father's court. After the Brahmins had been returned, Ashtavakra became egotistical and boasted of his greatness. Thus insulted by Ashtavakra, the Brahmins were offended. So this short little victory, Ashtavakra became very arrogant and he He got very egotistical.
Immediately, a woman sage appeared in a saffron garb, wearing long hair like the hermits. Due to her yogic accomplishment, she looked perennially young and was attractive. She greeted the Brahmins who had taken refuge in her, and after receiving due honor from the king, she consoled them and said, O son of Kahola, indeed you are very learned. You release the Brahmins by conquering Varuna's son in debate. Let me ask you some questions. Answer honestly. What is that state which assures immortality? If it is known, all doubts vanish. Nothing remains unknown. Nothing remains desired. And even the unknowable becomes knowable. If you know it, tell me. There's an interesting little twist here. You recall while I was reading the text that Ashtavakra was really very good at irrational logic, which means that he was still in the realm of logic. He was still an intellectual. And the lady hermit, she says, do you know that state which assures immortality? Which means, do you know through direct experience, pure consciousness? Have you attained it? Are you established in it? Because if you know it, then there are no doubts and nothing remains to be known and nothing remains to be desired. And even that which is unknowable becomes known. So if you know it, tell me. So, what does Ashtavakra say? I know that state. Listen, I will tell you. There's nothing in the world I do not know. So your question is no problem for me. You can hear now from his words that there is a great deal of arrogance and sounds almost also a bit like overconfidence. I have studied all the branches of knowledge in depth. Whatever you ask, I shall answer correctly. Just listen. Ashtavakra is talking about having studied. When we speak about intuitive knowledge through the self, we are not talking about having studied. When we talk about knowing everything and nothing remains to be known, we are not referring to having studied books and branches of science and, and book knowledge. We're talking about intuitive form of knowledge, having which one doesn't really need to have this kind of book knowledge. It is useful. The knowledge from books is useful to live in the world, but it's not absolutely necessary because book knowledge does not always make us happy, content, doesn't make us wise. So Ashtavakra, becoming very arrogant, says, just listen, that truth which you asked about is actually the cause of the universe. It has no beginning, middle or end. It is not limited by time and space. It is pure, indivisible and eternal. On the basis of that reality, this whole universe appears to exist. That truth is like a mirror which supports the image of the city, which reflects in it. After knowing the mirror, no doubt remains about the images reflecting in it. Similarly, after knowing that state of reality, a sadhaka attains immortality. If one has realized the real self, nothing remains unknown. After knowing the absolute, person desires nothing. According to the scriptures, the learned sages have come to the final conclusion about the nature of absolute reality. When he concluded, she said, O son of a sage, your answer is beautiful and logical. But you said no one knows that self-existent reality. Therefore, it cannot be known. At the same time, you said that only after knowing it, a sadhaka gains immortality. 
Is this not a contradictory statement? If it cannot be known, then you must admit that you do not know it. Then do not say the truth does not exist. But if it exists and you know it, then you cannot claim it cannot be known. Moreover, Brahmin, you are making these claims on the basis of scriptural knowledge. You do not know it directly. It is not direct knowledge. If you know about the nature of the universe and do not know the nature of the real self, what good is that knowledge? Do you not consider yourself defeated when you make such a self-contradictory statement in the court of Janaka? At these words, Ashtavakra became mum. So Ashtavakra had nothing to say because it was very clear that he had only intellectual knowledge, scriptural knowledge out of books. He became disappointed and ashamed. Looking down, he remained silent. After seriously considering her arguments, he conceded. O oh, great lady sage, I do not know the answer. I have become your disciple. Please tell me why there seem to be contradictions in the scriptures. I do not speak on truth, for it disturbs my austerities. That great lady was pleased to hear that Ashtavakra did not speak untruth. In front of the entire court, she told him, Lest son, for lack of knowing the depth of this knowledge, sadhakas become victims of the evil called attachment. This is not the subject matter for mere debate. The secret teaching is not fully explained by the Shastras. In this entire assembly of the learned, no one has profound knowledge of the truth. It is known to the king and me exclusively. In debates, no one raises such questions. Learned people with the help of knowledge, sorry, with the help of logic, have this knowledge in fragments. Mere debate will not reveal it. One must be at the service of a great adept and blessed by the self. So, the lady says, gives a very clear answer. You cannot get this direct knowledge in debates. In debates, you may get fragments of this knowledge with the help of logic. But the real truth you will only get when you are with an adept one who has a direct experience or has been blessed by the self. That is, by grace, you may acquire glimpses or experience that. O son of sage, be attentive. If the mind has not attained the state of tranquility and one-pointedness, there will be no gain. Unless this profound science is fully assimilated by your inner being, your listening to the scriptures even a thousand times will be of no use. If someone forgets he is wearing a necklace and presumes it has been stolen, he suffers. Even if someone tells him he is wearing it, if he does not see it, then no matter how intense his desire to find it, he will not find it. Likewise, O son of learned one, even after listening one-pointedly to a description of Atman and its nature, if one does not turn his mind inward, how can he expect to realize Atman within? A lamp must shed its light around itself. It cannot illuminate the space beneath. The sun does not depend on illumination from any other object because the sun is self-illuminated. By judging the darkness under the lamp, you cannot doubt the existence of the lamp. If it is true with lamps, then what about that which can never be illuminated by anything else? Someone may claim that absolute reality is ever illuminated. 
and at the same time beyond comprehension. Think about this carefully. Tripura is this supreme consciousness, the source of all. A self-existent illumination illuminates all. If the illumination is not her nature, then who has the power of illumination? Without profound introspection, even the most learned scholars cannot comprehend this deepest knowledge. That is why throughout life they remain in the darkness of ignorance. Without turning their minds inward, even great learned men cannot fathom this mystery. That is why they remain caught in the cycle of birth and death. Unless the mind is brought to the state of stillness, it is not possible to attain introspection. And unless introspection is fully developed, self-realization is not possible. The mind should first attain desirelessness and then penetrate into deeper levels. Now, to some of you this may sound contradictory. How does one become desireless first and then penetrate deeper levels? And then, isn't the object of objective to penetrate deeper levels to become desireless. Any thoughts about this? We do need to calm our conscious mind and attain a certain level of satisfaction and contentment before we can penetrate deeper levels. And then in deeper levels, one, we get an experience of superconscious meditation, that is a glimpse of pure consciousness, and we are also able to deal with our inner desires and let go of them. So a basic level of contentment or organizing one's life so that our deeper desires do not disturb us is required. So the Lady Hermit continues to speak and she says, Renounce all desires and strengthen only one desire that helps in self-surrender. Gain freedom. When you remember that state, then you will know that absolute reality is beyond, yet it can be attained. After knowing that absolute reality, you will attain the highest state of consciousness. Now I have explained all the secrets. O oh, son of sage, I bid goodbye to you. Let me go now. By listening only once to the secret of this knowledge, you cannot know the truth. King Janaka, the wisest of the wise, will impart this knowledge to you. You can ask questions to remove your doubts, and the king will dispel your ignorance. Thus she spoke and rose from her seat. The king worshipped her, and the assembly bowed to her with great reverence. She vanished suddenly, like a wind disperses the clouds. Tattatreya said, O Parshurama, I have already given you the method of realizing the self. So, here it says that direct knowledge is required and the way to do it is one, to calm the conscious mind be one-pointed in practice by strengthening only one desire. But there may be many other desires. We calm those, the conscious mind and we organize our life and then strengthen only one desire and that desire is to gain freedom. Right. 
So now the lady sage leaves and she says, she gives one more little hint here at the end. It is not possible to know the truth by hearing it one time. You must listen to this again and again. So it's not enough once. You have to listen to it again and again. And she recommends that they speak to King Janak, who's the wisest of the wise. Now, King Janak, as I mentioned, comes, features in many scriptures. And in this scripture, he explains the truth to Ashtavakra. In other scriptures, Ashtavakra is given the role of the teacher. And um, here, in fact, Ashtavakra is, is um, featured as an arrogant uh, person who is very intellectual. Uh, Shibu uh, had to drop out or, or left and he wrote there Ashtavakra Gita. That's another scripture in which Ashtavakra is a teacher. And here in this scripture, Ashtavakra is in fact been dismissed as a very arrogant person. It is possible that the Ashtavakra Gita came later after Ashtavakra perhaps acquired some direct experience. The dialogue between Ashtavakra and King Janaka, so we can continue and see what happens now. Uh, Shibu is back. You missed the part about Ashtavakra. <clears throat> so now Ashtavakra, who has, who was the teacher in the Ashtavakra Gita that you mentioned, has now been, who has now admitted that he actually does not know through direct experience, but has only scriptural knowledge, is now willing to learn from King Janaka. Parshurama, the son of the great Rishi Prabhu, was astonished at the dialogue between Ashtavakra and the ochre robed Devi, the Lady Renunciate. With great enthusiasm to know more, he put his question to Dattatreya. Lord, this ancient story is wondrous. Now kindly and systematically tell me how Ashtavakra approached the great Janaka and what Janaka said. This whole story is interesting and I have never heard such a thing before. Indeed, I must say that this story is very, very radical and unusual for its times, even for, for these times. Since the Brahmin has now been reduced to a arrogant person, uh, the learned Brahmin, who defeated uh, other Brahmins and who in debate and who had an ability to defeat even the son of Varuna in debate, has been reduced to an uh, arrogant and ignorant person. And he acquires this knowledge through a lady renunciate, also again very unusual, not only a renunciate but also a lady, which was unusual for those times and still unusual. And then he is instructed to learn from a king. Generally it was always reversed. The kings always asked the Brahmins for knowledge and wisdom and guidance. So you see, this scripture likes to turn things upside down and it does that deliberately to make you aware of your own habit patterns, your own way of thinking, these cultural habit patterns, these social habit patterns. And it shakes you up in your thinking. It makes you think and ask questions why is it why, why shouldn't the king teach the brahmin why is it always the other way around why shouldn't the lady be a renunciate 
or why shouldn't the lady tick off the Brahmin and, you know, um, teach him a thing or two. So Parshurama says, Gurudeva, the subject matter of the story is the essence of all sciences. Please be kind and help me. Thus the great Dattatraya began imparting the knowledge to Sri Parshurama. O Parshurama, listen to the tale of King Janaka attentively. After the great lady left for her celestial abode, Ashtavakra went to King Janaka along with many Brahmins. He wanted King Janaka to explain everything that was explained by the Lady Sage so he could assimilate it in its entirety. Listen to me with full attention. Ashtavakra said, The lesson that was imparted by the Lady Sage was very compact and abstruse. Therefore, I could not assimilate it fully. Kindly tell me the way to attain that knowledge. King Janaka was amazed that he posed such a question. O oh son of sage, listen to me. The highest state is neither knowable nor knowable, unknowable. Had it been unknowable, how could my master have taught me? The highest knowledge is imparted by the Guru Dev alone. Therefore, one should seek the refuge of a master with reverence. Attaining that state is very simple and very difficult. One whose mind has become one-pointed and inward, for him it is easy. One whose mind remains dissipated in the external world, for him it is very difficult. Actually, that higher state is inex inexplicable and unknowable, but there is a way of knowing it and attaining it. After careful analysis, the underlying principle, consciousness, is understood to be formless, abstract and separate from the external world. Yet it illuminates all the objects of the world. That which is not self-existent reality is subject to change and thus unreal. Consciousness is that which, through which all objects of the world are known. The seen is different from the seer, otherwise it could not be seen by the seer. Consciousness cannot be divided into parts. The division is seen in the world of objects. Their forms and names are different. Be aware of the absolute consciousness by emulating eliminating all these fleeting forms and names. As the various images are seen in the mirror, similarly, your consciousness assumes the different forms of the world. Your consciousness is the nature of the self. Therefore, it is not the subject matter of analysis. O Ashtavakra, realize yourself. Understand it. You are neither your body, nor prana, nor mind, for all are ever-changing. The body is a component of three humors, vata, pitta and kapha. How can they be your true nature? You are not the body, senses or mind, because they are all transient. This cannot be your true self. Supreme Consciousness never loses its self-awareness. Therefore, this consciousness is the knower of all. Turn your eyes inward and try to realize yourself as pure consciousness. The best students glimpse their essential nature even as their teacher is describing it. By eyes, I do not mean physical eyes, but the mental eye through which one sees dreams. It is important to know that. Turning the mind's eye inward means directing the mind within because nothing internal can be seen without an internal inward and one-pointed mind. So here we must understand he's describing the whole process and says you cannot be 
um, you, ha you have to go through this process and see that you are pure consciousness. And for that, you have to go inward. Only if you go inward is this possible. And see yourself. But you don't see yourself through the eyes that you possess, but through inward eyes, the mental eyes. The mental eyes are the eyes that see dreams. And not the eyes that we watch the world with. So we are not talking about our external eyes. So turning inward should be understood clearly. So when a person wants to look at something, first withdraws his attention from everything else and contacts only the objects that he wants to see. Only then does he perceive it. Without focusing his mind, he cannot even see objects directly in front of him. So I'm sure that all of you have had that awareness that we have so many objects in front of us, in front of our eyes, on a daily basis, and we are not registering everything. We are not really seeing, even though we are seeing it, we are not really seeing it. So really, to see something, to look at it, you have to focus on the object, and you, everything else is out of focus. It's like in a camera, when you focus on, on your object in front of you, everything else is out of focus. And so it is with, with the way we see the world, when we have an object in front of us. Right now, you may be sitting in front of your laptop or with your mobile phone, and your eyes are focused on that object. And you're not really so aware of everything else around you. And so we talk about focus here. You need to withdraw your attention from everything else and focus your attention then on the object. Continues now, as King Janaka continues to explain, those who do not withdraw their attention from here and there cannot see the object in front of their eyes. O Brahman, the nature of the other senses is similar. This applies to the mind when pain and pleasure are felt. When the mind is engaged elsewhere, pain and pleasure are not felt. Please listen attentively to what I have to say. Atman is within and without the orbit of the mind. Even the knowers of the Vedas and Shastras are deluded on this point. As regards external objects, the mind gets distracted in two ways. First, withdraw the mind from the objects of charms and temptations. Second, lead it to the goal of life. When the mind is voluntarily and completely withdrawn from the charms and temptations of life, it remains unaffected. It is important to have mastery over the dual tendency of the mind. So this is a very important paragraph for all of you who are practicing, who are on the path, who want to attain something, that you need to focus. Now, this is not merely in reference to attaining self-realization or higher state of consciousness, but even in our day-to-day -day life. If you want to achieve something, you need to focus your mind. You need to remove all the distractions from your mind and focus then on that particular thing that you want to achieve. So if we take the example of a young student, and if the student is very distracted by parties and friends and many different activities, you know, likes to organize different uh, events, and is very active in sport and culture and music and art, and we can imagine that such a student really does not have much time left or much mental energy left to focus on his studies, on the education. So what do you have to do in order to be successful in education? 
what would you recommend to the student to do? Concentrate on studies. Yes, but that's the second part. You see, the first part is what's important. First, to draw the mind from the objects and the charms and the temptations. So you have to do the first part. You, you get the point. You, you can say, concentrate on studies. But you can't really concentrate on studies when you're trying to do ten other things. So if you want to be really one-pointed, you have to be very, very focused. And you have to learn to let go of certain things. So while this scripture is not a scripture that is recommending you to become a renunciate, because you know that the teacher here is King Janaka. He was a king. He was, he was ruling a kingdom. And he was a wise king who had attained self-realization. The lady uh, renunciate said that only she and King Janaka had attained self-realization. So you can imagine that it's not necessary to, do, to give up everything, but to be successful in anything. You can ask anybody who is successful. They will tell you they're very focused and they have given up or let go of certain things. They have sacrificed. It's a sacrifice. So I know that there are many people who spend a lot of time uh, on Facebook, on, on social media. You know, it's, it's the new thing. Uh, uh, there was a time when everybody was, you know, spending a lot of time on, on television. Now television has, is almost gone and now people are addicted to internet and video games. And so you need to be focused and See, what do you want to achieve? And so if you say, in my life, I want to be a good student, then you have to let go first of certain things so you have more energy to focus on what you really want to do. So this paragraph is not merely for spiritual attainment, but also for worldly attainment. So withdraw your energies from those activities where you are not that interested or they are not helping you toward your final or most important goal of your life. King Janaka continues and he says, The perception of all external objects is influenced by our conceptions of time, space, and causation. The experience of them is possible through this twofold mental operation. But consciousness self is unlimited. Therefore, the mind's twofold operation does not apply. Consciousness can be realized simply by withdrawing the mind from all objects. If one wants to see the image of a certain object in the mirror, he must turn his object, his attention away from other images and one-pointedly fix his mind on the particular image he wants to see. If a man wants to see space in the mirror, he should remove the objects that create images in the mirror. The all-pervading void also exists in the mirror, but without removing the images, one cannot see it. Space is everywhere. It is the foundation of all. Therefore, when all objects are taken away, image-free space is clearly seen in the mirror. Similarly, consciousness is all-pervasive and the foundation of all. O Brahman, like space, it is ever-present in the mind. Thus, for self-realization, one simply has to withdraw the mind from all objects. O Brahman, can you find a place where consciousness is not present? So, coming back to the original point about studies. We took the example of a student and there was a two-fold process there. And we said, in order for a student to be successful, 
First, he has to remove all distractions and then concentrate on studies. Right? Step one, remove distractions. Step two, concentrate on studies. Right? And I said, you can be very successful in all our worldly activities through this twofold process. But what do we do when we want to be successful in the inner world? Do we have the same twofold process? And this scripture says that in, to be successful here, one needs to do only one part, and that's the first part. All you have to do is remove distractions. When you have removed all your distractions, the mind goes inward naturally. Which is why I say repeatedly to everybody, especially to those who are close students, Organize your life in such a way that your energies are not dissipated. When you practice, your mind will not keep running outward. It will naturally be contemplative and go inward. That is the nature of the mind. When the mind is not chasing external objects, it loves to contemplate. It's it's naturally going inward. We see that when we sleep. It just happens naturally. You don't say, I want to sleep, I have to force myself to sleep. It happens. The more you force yourself to sleep, the less likely you are to fall asleep. If you're lying there saying, I have to sleep, I have to sleep, you cannot sleep. You will keep awake. Similarly, you have... In meditation, all you need to do is remove the distractions, go inward, <clears throat> create an atmosphere, create a lifestyle and organize your life in such a way that you make time for that which is really important to you, which is spiritual attainment. So, Shibu says, when the, t when the mind withdraws from the objects, there's fear and agony. And then again, it's running away out. Very good point, Shibu. Very good point that shows you've been practicing. That's very good. Yes. It does happen that turmoil comes up from within. And then, yes, because we have not tidied up our inner world, all that stuff comes forward. That unfortunately is a process we need to go through. So yes, the mind goes within and then we have to deal with what is within. It becomes contemplative, it makes you think about these things. So that pain and that agony which you experience within, you contemplate on it and ask yourself, why do you have it? Why is it there? And you will discover attachment, you will discover your lack of understanding and you learn to let go of these things and as you purify this you clear up you tidy up your internal world just as you organized your external world you need to organize your internal world and you organize your internal world by letting go all these deep seat deep rooted habit patterns memories emotions behavioral patterns, thinking patterns, negative uh, thinking patterns. And when you have tidied up your internal world, the mind will keep going internal, keep going inward. And as it keeps going inward, it will find peace, beauty, joy. And and it's not like you have to wait for years and years for that. You will already start experiencing it. The moment you start doing it, you will see that happening, coming little, little glimpses, little glimpses. And it's these glimpses which will keep you going, which give you the encouragement. Because just one second, even a few seconds of this profound joy is worth all the joys, all the external joys. You can experience pleasure for, for a whole year but that pleasure you will experience in that few moments of joy 
and you if you would weigh it together you know on a weighing scale you will you will say to for yourself yes that one one or two moments was worth all the pleasure that you might experience in an entire year it is so beautiful so profound so deep that's why we say it cannot be explained that's why the sages say not this not this neti neti they are unable to explain the beauty that is within us a good place to stop I think the last part especially was very useful i hope it was hope it was a nice session and enjoy your time and oh yes thank you uh, very we will have a nice time in the retreat and so we will not have our last uh, next session next weekend and we will have our next online meeting only 2 weeks from now okay bye bye everyone bye pranam everybody pranam